forever. Amen. Pastor Bill is not here this morning, which means the average age of people on stage is significantly less. And it's about to get even more or less because we have the great opportunity to hear from some of our youth students about the mission trips that we had this past summer. We had a high school one and a middle school one. These mission trips are a great opportunity for students to really live out some of our core values at East Main Church. Um, and we have four in particular I like to emphasize with our students, uh, particularly those who are committed to the work at hand. Those values are to show up, to grow up, to step up, and then to reach out. And these mission trips are a great opportunity for students to really adhere to that step up stage in their commitment, to really step up into an opportunity that, yes, may be tiresome, may be hard work, may be uncomfortable at times, and yet is good, good work that needs to be done. So I'm going to invite, actually, the Bishop girls, uh, both who went on the high school mission trip, to come up, and they are going to tell us a little bit about their respective trips this summer. Uh, good morning, I'm Abby Bishop, and a few weeks ago, I went on the middle school mission trip to Erie. Uh, throughout the week, we completed a couple service projects, including uh, helping at like a lunch bunch vac vacation Bible school sort of thing, where we would go in the morning, and we would play with some of the kids that went there, and then we would eat lunch with them, and then uh, in the afternoon, we would play with them outside. Um, we played Foursquare, uh, played in the sprinkler, and lots of other things. Um, we also helped uh, to stain a few people's ramps that like, uh, put like a waterproofing stain on them. Um, we did two of those. And then surprisingly this year, we did not do any weeding. So that was actually pretty nice. <laughs> uh, so some of my favorite parts of the week were definitely the car rides to all the places we went because uh, we would always listen to music and like just scream the songs, which was really fun. Um, we also played a lot of fun games, including water polo, which is basically like football in the water. Uh, we didn't have any injuries, so that was also good. Um, on Thursday night, I think, or Wednesday night, we went to Lake Erie, uh, and we went swimming. Um, we ate dinner together, and then we dug a very deep hole, uh, and then everybody got buried in it. It took a long time, but it was definitely worth it. Um, we had a really great group this year of 16 people. Uh, the energy was always just like exciting, upbeat, and we were always ready to serve. Uh, and throughout the week, we also noticed God's presence in a lot of ways. Um, we sang Christian songs with the kids to help them to get to know God. Um, and even just that small act, it was nice to see how God would work through the kids throughout the week. Um, he also kept all of us safe this week. Like I said, we had no injuries or any super bad accidents or anything. Um, and he also gave us uh, patience, happiness, strength, and everything we needed to get through the week. So I'm her sis older sister, Alexis, and um, I got to go on the high school mission trip to Wilmington, Delaware. Um, at the beginning of the week, we have like an orientation dinner with a bunch of the staff from Urban Promise. And one of the leaders there, James, talked about uh, when he was younger, and he was a street leader, which is like a crew leader, um, how there's this one kid, uh, and later in life he ended up struggling with different stuff, but he found James again and told him that his six weeks at Urban Promise was when he felt most loved. And for me, that was something that stuck with me throughout the week, because when kids got tired, they didn't want to do things, when they weren't listening or cooperating, uh, it was one of those things that, like, even now, uh, even in those hard moments, it can make a difference for these kids, and you never know what they're going through. Uh, so after we helped with the kids in the morning, we would go do service projects in the afternoon. And for us, it was demoing a kitchen, uh, which in real life does not look like it does on all the TV shows. <laughs> um, and then afterwards, we got to scrub some grout, uh, which I enjoy personally watching all the dirt go bye-bye. Um, and then we got to take all of the cabinets to landfill and throw them out into the abyss. And that was a good way to uh, get rid of some pent-up anger. 
And then Friday, uh, we drove to Ocean City, New Jersey, and that night we did a reflection on the week, and I think it was just a really good opportunity to see the small and big ways that God was working through us through the week and the different moments that stuck out to us and just kind of thinking and reflecting. Oh, you're good. Thank you so much, guys. Appreciate it. <laughs> yes, eight high schoolers, 16 middle schoolers, um, all with an incredible drive and eagerness to do the work that I was at hand without complaining or grumbling. It was fantastic. And none of that would have been available, first of all, uh, without our missions committee and you guys with the money that was provided during the Lenten offering. So we thank you for that and funding it. Uh, and of course, a big thanks to Keith Johnson, who I just found out 14 years. This is his 14th year doing it. Is that right? 14 years he's been going on this trip. Thank you so much, Keith, for that. Um, thank you to my wife, Caroline Fugate, who was still working in the midst of helping out in the middle of that. Thank you there. And Taylor Hughes as well, who uh, just comes back to Pennsylvania and rolled right into working as well. And finally, big thanks to uh, Tracy Jackson, who not only helped prep a lot of what the mission trips were, but went on both of them. God bless her heart. So we are really, really thankful for the leaders, everyone that prayed to make this happen. Um, as we transition to the message for today, uh, I'm going to tell you something I learned about myself on the middle school mission trip. Um, and one thing I learned is something that you should know beforehand, which is that I love blankets and I can't sleep without blankets. I need blankets. If it's the middle of the summer, I will have a blanket on. I will turn up the air conditioning so that I can sit comfortably in a blanket. I love being in a blanket. And the irony of that is that as I was leaving my house the morning of the missus trip, I forgot to pack a blanket. And I was like, well, that's okay. I'll just grab one from my office. And as we left the church, I forgot the blanket in my office. I was like, well, that's okay. Caroline's coming up a little later. She'll bring me a blanket. And I forgot to ask her for a blanket. So the whole week, I went without a blanket. I was like, all right, Luke, this is a good chance to test yourself. Maybe you don't need a blanket. Maybe you can live without a blanket. It was wrong. Uh, I did need a blanket. I had horrible sleep. And it got worse because halfway through the week, they fixed the air conditioning. And so you found me awake in the morning at 5 a.m. grabbing one of my beach towels, which is never long enough, and just doing this. Definitely need the blanket. <laughs> and uh, I will never forget from this point on. It's a silly example, little story. Uh, but the need of good things in our lives is actually can become dangerous of sorts. The need of good things in our lives, dangerous. In fact, few things threaten our faith more than a good gift of God, beautiful and innocent as it may be, that slowly becomes necessary for our happiness. Few things threaten our faith more than a good gift of God slowly becoming necessary for our happiness. John Piper, the pastor, writes, The most deadly appetites are not for the poison of evil, but for the simple pleasures of earth. For when these replace an appetite for God himself, the idolatry is scarcely recognizable and almost incurable. The simple pleasures of earth are good things, of course. A satisfying career, a healthy body, a best friend, a fulfilling marriage, and every other good gift comes down from the Father, like the heavens themselves, and it declares something of God's glory. When Paul says that God richly provides us with everything to enjoy, he really means enjoy. God's ocean of gifts is meant for swimming. But the simple pleasures of earth are never completely safe in the hands of sinners and even redeemed ones. Without care, we feast on the abundance of God's house and forget that it is his house. We eat and we eat and gradually neglect the host, eyes lower from heaven to earth, spiritual senses dull, and desires for other things begin to choke what is important. 
In moments like these, it is one of God's severe mercies to deal with us as he dealt with the Israelites and to send us into the wilderness. That's where our scripture comes from today, the wilderness, in Deuteronomy chapter 8, 11 through 14. These are Moses' words to the Israelites. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, and his decrees that I am giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increases and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Forty years have passed since God stretched out his arm over Egypt and rescued the Israelites. Israel is now standing on the edge of the Jordan in this particular sentence with their backs to the wilderness, ready to answer the promised land and about to trade the manna that they've been having for milk and honey. But Moses knows the hearts of the people too well. Moses knows that the Israelites are forgetful and wandering people. In fact, the Israelites have been wandering the desert 40 years, due in part to their forgetfulness, neglecting the covenant that they had made with God time and time again. And so Moses writes Deuteronomy, which the name Deuteronomy literally means, and I only learned this this past year, second law. It's called second law, not because it is part two of God's law, but because it is a rehash of all the other laws in Leviticus and Exodus and Numbers because the Israelites need the repetition to hear it over and over again. I don't think we're dissimilar to that. In fact, God bless my wife. <laughs> um, one of my sworn duties in my household is to take out the trash. And it's hard to forget taking out the trash because trash buildup is obvious. But on Friday morning this week, my wife and I wake up to the sound of the very loud garbage truck at 8 a.m. on our street, and we both look at each other and think, we forgot the trash. <laughs> and I did, in fact, forget the trash. In fact, I often forget the trash, even though it's so obvious, and I should remember. And so if you ever see me or hear me pulling a large bin at 6 a.m. on Friday morning, you know it's because I forgot my trash. We are not unlike that, forgetting things that are important, and maybe even more important than trash. And so in this passage, Moses is reminding us to be careful not to forget the Lord as a particular lesson that they should have learned in the wilderness. In fact, in a couple of verses earlier to this, he says, God humbled you and let you hunger. God humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but by man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. That probably sounds familiar. Bread is another one of earth's simple pleasures, a kindness from God meant to strengthen one man's heart, as we read in the Psalms. But when Israel was in the wilderness, the giver of bread took away the bread so that Israel might know where life comes from. Life, which is a true and deep and abundant life, does not come from bread or any other form of God's gifts. Life comes from the words of the living God, words that are better than gold, sweeter than honey, more nourishing than the best foods. If Israel was ever going to stand in the promised land, which is what they were about to enter, with their hands full of bread that God has given them and say, I know how to abound, they would first need to walk through the wilderness with God's words in their heart, and say, I know how to be brought low. They would need to learn how to look around at a wasteland of sand and sing for joy 
to the one who gives and takes away. So it is often with us. Often God teaches us how to handle his good gifts rightly by first withholding those gifts from us. When I was a teenager, I came into something called disposable income. It was fantastic. I didn't know what to do with it because I didn't have taxes or any debts or anything. So I used that disposable income on the best thing I knew how, which was Sheets hot dogs. Love Sheets hot dogs. There is a time when you can get two for a dollar. Bruce came up to me afterwards, the first service, and says, there was a time when you can get two for 15 cents. I said, oh, Bruce. I love Sheets hot dogs. I ate Sheets hot dogs all the time when I was a teenager. My parents called them death dogs, rightly so. They were not good for you. But there was one week I remember in the summer where I had Sheets hot dogs every single day of the week. I did not learn my lesson, apparently, because when I was a bachelor the first time in Grove City, I had cheats hot dogs about every week I was here. My parents tried to teach me the lesson by forbidding me from a whole summer from getting cheats hot dogs, withholding what was good, not good for you, but good, in order to remind me that life is not all about the cheats hot dogs. (laughs) And so, too, does the Lord do that, and often with things that are far better than hot dogs, too. I believe God does this for at least two reasons. The first is this. The wilderness exposes what's inside our hearts like nothing else does. For all the beauty that the promised lands, hills, and forests had to offer for the Israelites, they also offer dozens of hideouts for idols. It is frighteningly easy to give lip service to God while our hearts are lost in his gifts. Hallelujah! All I have is Christ! We may sing with both hands lifted up on a Sunday. Not this church, but other churches. While the tendrils of our hearts slowly wrap themselves around a marriage, a friendship, or a career. Scarcely recognizable, almost incurable. But not so in the wilderness, where our idols can only sit on the sand. What comes out of you when you are in the rubble of a broken friendship, prolonged season of singleness, a job that feels utterly hollow? Some of us, like Israel, find ourselves... As uh, Pastor Sarah Grove says, painting pictures of Egypt. We idolize our former life and we pine for its comforts, forgetting maybe how godless that time was. Other of us run to other pleasures in an attempt to ease the pain that we're feeling. Many of us, including me, grumble against the God who takes them away. Our seasons of lack do not create the cancer that comes out of us in those moments. They expose what was already there, what was hidden by abundance. In God's kindness, he puts our idols in plain view in the desert so that we might see them and hate them and give them their grave in the desert. Second reason is this. The wilderness can cultivate in us a quality that is so beneficial to our faith, desperation. Left to ourselves in uninterrupted comfort, many of us wander. Sleep gradually swallows up our mornings, leaving little time for prayer or scripture. We live as if sin no longer crouches at the door, ready to pounce. We become careless with the one part of us we can't afford to lose, our souls. In fact, so threatening often is abundance that the writers of Proverbs chapter 30 gives this warning and prayer for himself. Keep falsehood and lies from me. Give me neither poverty, makes sense, nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, 
I may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of my God. Rightly, we see he prays for the strength to be out of poverty, lest he dishonor. We also praise neither for riches, lest he forget God. But those who are desperate, in desperation, find themselves in a wasteland of life, don't have that luxury to forget God. In fact, often those who are desperate stir themselves to seek God. They come to their Bibles like David did in Psalm 13. Consider me and answer me, O Lord my God. Lift up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Those who are desperate find they can scarcely go an hour, let alone a day, without lifting up their hearts to the only one who can help. Eventually, they become part of that great fellowship that Jesus talks about in the Beatitudes, those of the poor in spirit, who know not just in theory, but in blood-earnest reality that God is near the brokenhearted, and he hears the cries of the afflicted. And that, compared to a godless promised land, a God-filled wilderness is heaven. If we learn to live by God's word in the wilderness, we will find ourselves more ready to use his gifts for what they really are. They are servants of joy in God, not substitutes for him. Those humbled by the wilderness will enjoy God's gifts, not abuse them. They will delight in them, not put their hope in them. They will bless God for them, not forget him in the good gifts. And even if God never gives the gift we most want, and the wilderness becomes a lifetime, we will not grumble our way into eternity. We will instead strive to become a monument in the wilderness, chiseled with the words that are better than abundance. The steadfast love of the Lord is better than life. And so if you find yourself in some dry and barren land, cut off from life's milk and honey, do not waste that season. Yes, give grief and sorrow and tears their place, but do not murmur and curse God in the midst of it. For all the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness. All the paths, even the ones that take us through the desert, steadfast love has brought you here, and he will never leave you nor forsake you. But if you find yourself in plenty, as I find myself in often, even with the ups and downs of life, you find yourself financially capable, living comfortably, do not let ease and comfort become king. Do allow them to become kings such that we forget the work that is before us. I told our middle schoolers before we left, many of them were very excited about the work they were doing. In fact, some of them were saying, I wish we could stay longer to do the work that they're doing. And I was fired up about them catching the spark and desire and joy to serve God. And in the middle of that, I took time to caution The caution being, I am excited that you have this joy for serving, but mission trips are carefully curated for you. And when you go on from this mission trip, there will be lots of work to do, but the work won't be nearly as fun or as joy-giving. In fact, it'll be messy and it'll be dirty and it'll be uncomfortable at times and maybe even dangerous at times. Will you still have that excitement you have now? 
Or will you let the pleasures, monotony of life's comfort get in the way? If you are in Christ, God has brought you into a desert, not to starve you. Or he's given you plenty, not for its own sake. He has brought you there to teach you that your life, your hope, your joy are not hidden away in some elusive land of plenty, but are in Christ who died and rose again to save you for himself. The one who is your life, who is your pleasure, your milk and honey and your all. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the wilderness. Lord, it can be hard to see the greater picture in the midst of a barren land where we are feeling lost, where we are feeling neglected, where we are confused, where we are not sure what to do, and we don't know if you're near. In those moments, it is hard to see how in the world this can be used for good, but God, open our eyes to see heaven that we might see your glory, that we may understand that the wilderness often is for our own good. Lord, we thank you for the plenty and abundance that you have given many of us. We thank you that you have given us those good gifts to enjoy, but we ask that you would keep us from making them idols of our lives and instead using these for the joy of others. Lord, we thank you that you never 